this video I want to talk about the relative uh, distance between the notes in any given triad. At this point in time we're still talking about root position triads, although what I'm about to say is really true even when you get into inversion. So it's good information to just have in the back of your mind whenever you're voicing out a triad. And what I'm really referring to here is when I say the distance between the notes is what is the total spread from top to bottom of the notes that you are voicing in four parts. So let's get right into some examples and we can kind of talk about the do's and don'ts and the, and the guidelines for good and bad practice as we do this. For the purposes of this, I've taken an F major triad. It's, there's no, I just picked that kind of at random. It's an F major triad that I'm going to voice in different ways. It could have been a, a minor triad, it could have been a diminished triad. The quality of the triad doesn't really matter. What matters is the relative distance between the notes, and we'll talk about that as we go. Another thing that I will not be mentioning, but you might come across in uh, studying music theory beyond this course or in reading music theory in a textbook is something called open, closed and neutral structure. I've mentioned those names, open, closed and neutral structure because you may encounter them but I don't tend to use those terms. So I'm going to go ahead and present this in the way I prefer to think about it but you should be aware that really what I'm telling you does have some connection to an interaction with the idea of open, closed and neutral structure should you read that in another source. So let's have a look at what would happen if we just took this chord, this triad, and we voiced it out. Here is one way that one could voice this out. In this particular case, you'll notice that the top three notes are relatively close to one another. If I took these top notes and I chose, instead of writing them out in traditional four-part voicing, S-A-T-B, and instead I just took the top three notes and I wrote them out on a separate staff, they would look like this. Right? That's those three notes there, written out like that. Now, this still has the bass note underneath, so I know this could look like I've written a triad in inversion here, but we're assuming that this bass note is still underneath, so it's still in root position. But what I'm pointing out is that the three notes here are relatively close to each other. They're about as close as they could get to one another. I can write another uh, triad, the same triad. I can uh, write it out another way where it's similarly packed together. I can keep the same bass note, but I could choose instead to say write this. The tenor here is up quite high, but that's perfectly acceptable for a tenor to go up, uh, up a, a high like that. It can go even a little higher than that if it wants. But if I take these same top three notes and I write them out in this format up here, I would find that I have F, A, and C. I've actually got those notes there. Those three notes are those same three notes there. This F, of course, is really this F here. It's just written on the bass clef to show soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. So we're clear who is singing what. The, the clarity of who, where each line is moving, especially if we were writing more than one chord in succession, then the clarity of who has what note is very distinct in this format. And that's why we use it. But this is, in fact, the same thing as this. These three notes sing it. And they are packed close together. They are as close together as they can get, really, with a bass note underneath. Now, here's another example, all right? and this is, this is spread out much more. It's not wrong, it's just a different way of spreading the voices out. Here I have F, I've doubled the F in the alto, I have A, and I have C. Still F, A, and C, it's the same tri basic triad, the same starting point, but now the voices are spread out far more. There is a more or less equal distance between the upper three voices, and there is a greater distance between the bass and the tenor. Obviously, I could spread this out even more. I could say have an F at the bottom, 
could spread the voices out so that there's quite a large distance between them where uh, the F at the top and the F at the bottom are a considerable distance from one another, certainly a lot further apart than the top and bottom note of the chord here is. This is also perfectly fine, there is nothing wrong with this chord. I've just made a decision to spread the parts out. Now, the reason you would make a decision like this would, again, it's, everything is about context. It's about the chord that comes before it, the chord you're dealing with, and the chord that comes after. And when we talk about these chords in progression, you will see that once you make a decision early on, that tends to define the way the chords will look, how close they will be together, or how far apart they will be spread for a period of time, often even for an entire exercise as we look at short seven, eight, nine chord progressions. You may find you, all your notes are close together or they're all spread out. Or it may be that over the course of five or six chords they move from being closer together to more spread out. But they do so in a logical fashion where they are following one another in a way that makes voice leading sense. So what I'm saying is in isolated circumstances any of these, a wider spread or a closer spread, could make sense. But there are some things to avoid. It is generally the case in this style period that you can have more of a gap between the tenor and the bass, say having soprano and alto and tenor packed up quite close, and then a wider gap. You have a gap between the tenor and the bass. This is good. This is okay. This seems to work well. Equally, just graphically looking at it, having more or less equal distance between the soprano and alto and the tenor and the bass. This also is good. This generally works well. And so having either the top three notes packed quite close together and a larger gap between the tenor and the bass, or having all four voices more or less equal distance apart, that works well. Those two ways of voicing a chord, spreading a chord out, work well. Where you have problems, where you have challenges often, where things start to not sound as solid as they might, is when you have a soprano and an alto close, and a tenor and a bass close, and your gap is here. This is generally a no zone. We do not do that. You do not want to have a large gap between alto and tenor. Either the tenor moves up, becomes quite high, and closes the gap so the top three voices are more close together and there's a larger gap between the bass and the tenor, or the alto moves down a little bit, perhaps the tenor moves up a little bit, and there's equal distance, more or less, between the voices. But you want to try and avoid a large gap between the alto and the tenor. Similarly, you want to avoid a gap between the soprano and the alto. That is also generally a weaker voicing, a weaker spread. You want to try and avoid having the gap here. If you're going to have a gap, it's usually between tenor and bass. You do not want a gap between soprano and alto or alto and tenor. Either keep those voices packed up close to each other with a distance between the tenor and the bass or spread the voices out so they are more or less evenly spaced from one another. But avoid a gap between soprano and alto and between alto and tenor. If when you voice your chords out you do follow these guidelines, you will have much greater success and your harmonic progressions are going to sound more solid, more logical when you play them back. They're going to sound more like common practice progressions. It is not that this is right or wrong in the broadest sense of writing music. It is that this is just not part of what was commonly done in the common practice era. And if we're going to write in common practice style, then we would want to avoid these things that were not common, and we would want to emulate those things that were more common. So that's why why we, uh, we avoid this and we tend to write the chords either more tightly packed in the top three voices with a greater distance between tenor and bass or evenly spread between all the voices. Take some triads and try writing them out both in good solid spreads where you would expect them to be and write them out 
incorrectly, see what it feels like to write them out and have the, the voices spread a little, a little strangely. Because the more you become familiar with good writing practice and familiar with when you're doing things that are not quite so uh, part of the common practice, you will at least then uh, have an idea of when you get into context writing these in, in a series of chords, you'll have a better idea of what it takes to write good progressions versus when you start to write things that just don't seem to be working or functioning or feeling right uh, when it comes to the spread of the voices. So practice with these, taking some triads, pick a triad and write it out in some various ways that are both good and are bad and see if you can kind of feel the difference. And we'll look up at this in more detail in class of course and begin to incorporate this in the next few videos into actual progressions from one chord to the next to the next to the next.